Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Jesus died on a Friday. Uh, the Sabbath was Saturday. Uh, that was a day of rest for them. When it was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him, that is, anoint his body. Uh, the, the day of the cross and, and his death and the burial uh, was uh, a chaotic day, and so um, they didn't have a chance to do that. It was the normal practice that you would anoint uh, the body, and they wanted to do this. And it says very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, they came to the tomb when the sun had ri risen. So it was early. They got up first thing. They had this planned out. They weren't going to do it on the day of the Sabbath. And it says, And they said among themselves, Who's going to roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So bless these women's hearts. They wanted to do this thing for the Lord. They wanted to do this thing to honor him. They, as far as they know, as all they know is that he's gone, but this is one way, one more way they can stay connected to him and they want to, uh, uh, show honor and respect and they, they want to go anoint his bodies and his body and they, they go get these spices. They make it and it's early and they go all the way down to the tomb. And when they get the, when they're almost there, they're, it all, then it dawns on them. Wait a minute. How are we going to get in there? They put a big old stone, and that's how they would. That's how it was done. Uh, they would put it in a a, a carved a, a tombstone, a, a a tomb carved out of stone, and then they would roll a giant rock in front of it, and that's how the person was buried. And it just didn't occur to them that, oh wow, how are we going to do this? If you've ever gone somewhere, I I, uh, I have a lot of keys, and um, the, I have a lot of keys for the church. And I don't like to carry them around with me all the time because it's just too many. Every once in a while, I'll get all the way down to the church. And right when I'm walking up the door, I'll go, Ugh, I forgot my keys. I can't get in. And, and they got all the way down there like, oh, man, how are we going to get in? And so they asked that. Verse 4 says, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And it was very large. It was a very large stone. So they're like, whoa. It's already out of the way. And entering the tomb, so they went inside, and they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Rightly so. I mean, what's this guy doing in there? And he doesn't look normal. He's, we're going to find out. He's, it doesn't say so, but it's obvious that he's an angel. It says it in one of the other Gospels. And, and, uh, and so they're kind of creeped out and what's going on. And they don't see a body. They see an angel and the tomb was open. Verse 6, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. It's okay. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. I know you're looking for him. The one who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? And so he, he just lets them, he know, he lets them know right away, I know why you're here, I know what you're looking for, I know what you're here for, and, and he lets them know. He's not here, he's risen from the dead, you can still look where he was. And then verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, I love how he says that, go tell his disciples, disciples and Peter, singles Peter out, Peter would definitely want to know this, he Felt bad for his his uh, denial of Jesus, and and it says, "Go tell his disciples and Peter that he, that is Jesus, is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. You're not going to see him here, but you'll see him there, as he said to you." So this is something Jesus already told him what happened. Verse eight says, "So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb." I I don't know the quickness is probably a combination of things, a combination of like, that was really weird. That was a little scary. There's an angel in there and what's going on. And, and, and it says they trembled and were amazed, dumbfounded, scared, all rolled up into one, confused. 
and they said nothing to anyone. They, they, they had to still go to where the disciples were. They probably passed other people, and they didn't say anything to anybody they passed. It says because they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. And, th and this, is, this is noteworthy that he, it says this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we get into the application. But it, the Holy Spirit went out of his way to let us know that she was the first person that saw him raised. He appeared to her first. And, and then it tells us something we already learned somewhere else, uh, maybe Matthew or Luke, I don't remember, that, that this is the Mary out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. This woman had, before she came to faith, she was possessed by seven demons. Now, if you're a believer, you had all kinds of issues and problems and uh, sins before you came to the Lord. You still struggle with things. He's still working on you. But I don't know if any but us, any of us had seven demons in us. I know I didn't, and I had all kinds of issues. Seven demons this woman had. She's the one that Jesus, and Jesus cast those demons out of her. She became a follower, and, and she's the first one that got to see him. And she went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. So when she got there to tell them, they were still weeping. It's only been uh, a couple days. It's the third day since this happened. And, and so she went and told, told them. And, and when they heard that he was alive and had not seen her, uh, and had been seen by her, they didn't believe. She goes and tells them, just like the angels said, go tell them. They're, they're upset. They're mourning. She tells them. I saw him, the tomb's empty, and it says they didn't believe. That means they didn't believe what she said. They didn't believe her. And, and after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. This is probably the same guys that Luke talks about, when those guys that were on the road to Emmaus, and they hung out with Jesus, and he like told them all the Old Testament scriptures that talked about him, and they didn't realize it was him, and then he... Uh, broke bread with them and, and they realized in the breaking of bread they're like whoa that was Jesus and they recognized him and so probably those two guys and it says and when and they went and told it to the rest but they did not believe them either so they're told these guys are told the disciples are told two times by other believers that they saw Jesus risen from the dead and, and they don't believe it. And that's after Jesus told them before, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die and be buried. And then I'm going to raise from the dead on the third day. So they didn't believe it. Verse 14 says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. So finally, the rest of the eleven, because Judas obviously is not one of them anymore and he's, and he's gone. And he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. They finally get to see Jesus risen from the dead. And the first thing that happens is they get rebuked. That's not nice, but it needed to happen. And we'll talk about that during our application as well. Verse 15 said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So this is the message he gave to them. And then verse 19 says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, and understand, this isn't, this isn't the only events. We have, the, we have Matthew's account, Luke's account, John's account of all the things. 
uh, Mark is encapsulating the key events that happened from the resurrection to the ascension, the parts that the Holy Spirit moved him to record. And so all, a lot of the other, st the other stuff that we read about, you know, Jesus, uh, Peter being restored and, and uh, Mary actually seeing him, all that stuff is, fits in between all of these verses uh, of chapter 16. And it says, he, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs, the accompanying signs that he just talked about there. And, and it says, amen. And so there's... Mark's account, and it's commonly thought, believed that Mark, Mark's account was Peter's account, that Peter uh, is the one that told Mark uh, the, the thing. So this is, that's the, the common understanding. The foundation of our faith, the foundation of what Christianity, of what being a Christian, what being a believer in Jesus is, is Jesus. He himself is the foundation of our faith. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He's everything. Who he is and what he did is everything. And the pinnacle of what he did is that he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again. So the pinnacle of, who, of what he is, who is the, the foundation and everything that we believe in, is Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was buried, and, and that was Good Friday. And today we celebrate that he didn't stay dead, he rose from the dead, Resurrection Sunday. And, and that's so much the, the, the cornerstone, so important that the Bible teaches that you're not a Christian. You're not actually a believer. You're not actually saved. You're not actually going to heaven without believing and committing your life to the fact that that actually happened. It says in Romans that if you confess with your mouth, that means say it, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that means like you're in, inside, as much as you can, you believe it in the depths of your being, that God raised him from the dead, that the resurrection happened, it says that you will be saved. And, and nothing else that we can talk about, and that even that we will talk about this morning as we study the Bible, as we study Mark 16, matters as much as that matters. That matters so much that if you haven't yet believed in your heart, if you haven't yet said, Jesus is Lord of my life, then that's what you need to do right now. If you listen to this entire message and have never done that, then, then the, the rest of the message is, it doesn't matter as much as that does. So really, really, before you even listen to another word, before you dig into your Easter candy, before you have your ham or your lamb or whatever else it is that you do on Easter, before you do anything else, you, if you've never settled that issue, that you're going to believe Jesus, that you're going to commit yourself to him, to, to, to believe that he is Lord of your life, that he is the one that saves you, that he died and rose again. If you haven't done that yet, please do that now. What are you waiting for? The time that we live in, we live in a world of death. We are all headed for the grave. We are all going to enter into eternity. Every single one of us is going to die and stand before God. And if we make it through the coronavirus, and, I, and most of us will, we're still going to die and we're still going to face God and we still need salvation. And, and Jesus provides that. That's the gospel. That's the good news. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're going to stand before God. We're going to have to answer. We're going to stand before God sin, as sinners. And the only way we're going to make it through and, and be saved is if we believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for sins and that he rose again. That's everything. And, it, and it's so important that it's worth saying that but from the get-go of our message right now.
Now, for many of us, we know that, and we believe that, and we praise God for that, and that's why we're here, that's why we're doing what we're doing, and we do it all the time. That's why we can't wait to get back to church together. That's why even if we can't be in church, we're following Him, and we're worshiping Him, even if it has to be over the Internet and technology. We, we know that, but we also know that there's a lot more to learn. That while the resurrection is the climax and the peak of what Jesus did, there's, there's also so much for us to take in as well. And so our passage today, I'm going to ask one simple question. And that simple question, if we're, going to, we're going to think about that simple question as we go through the text again. And the, the simple question is, what, okay, so he died and he said it's finished. And then he rose again. Okay, so that proves everything that he ever said. So then what was he doing after he rose from the dead? What was he trying to accomplish? If he said it's finished and it's paid in full, why, did, why are these other things recorded? And, and we're going to look at Mark 16, um, one of the four passages that tell that he rose from the dead, with that question in mind. And none of, the, none of them are exhausted, but we're going we're to answer that question just by looking at Mark. That knowing that there were other things that he did, and, this, and if, before we answer specifically, in general, in general, the, the answer to that question is, what was he doing after he rose from the dead is, what was he doing? He was doing what he always did. He was still teaching. He was still instructing. He was still pointing us to the Father. But from Mark 16, we're going to look at six more specific things that he did. Things that Jesus wanted us to know, and it was important that he said these after he was risen from the dead to drive him home. And so we're going to look at six, six things. And the first one is that after Jesus rose, he wanted to make it clear that he rose. And he wanted to do that because that fact and reality is extremely motivating for us. It's how we are saved by believing that, as we said, but it's also very motivating. Think about that early tomb scene that we just read about a minute ago. Mary, Mary and, her, and the other, and Mary, Mary and Salome, they, they just wanted to do what they could. It wasn't much. It was all they could do. They, they had spices. They wanted to anoint the body. They couldn't, they didn't plan it out very well because they didn't think about how they would get in. They, they forgot to figure that out. But when they got there, they were totally surprised. And, and, and because the, the tomb was already open, the stone was already rolled away. Now, why was it? Why was the stone rolled away, by the way? Know this. The stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus, Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that they could get in. We learn in John's gospel that Jesus doesn't require doors anymore after he is risen from the dead. He doesn't need doors. That's a kind of a nice thing. You don't need doors. But they still needed doors. They still needed things to be open if they were going to get inside. And so the stone was rolled away so that they could get in. Well, then what about the angel? Why was the angel there? Well, the angel wasn't there on guard duty. There was nothing to guard. He was there to do what he was there to do and be what angels simply do and are. Angels are first and foremost primarily messengers. That's what they are. And he was there to deliver a message. His message. He said it. He said, He is risen. He's in, he isn't in the tomb. He's alive. And more than just alive. He, used, he said, he used the word, he is risen. And that's, that's more than alive. Because living people die. R living people still die. Risen people have conquered and defeated and overcome death. So he's more than alive, he's risen. Now, why didn't Jesus just stay there to tell all that himself? Why didn't he do that? And that's a decent question. It's interesting to note that none of the Gospels ever placed Jesus risen from the dead in the tomb. Now, that doesn't mean he wasn't. He rose from the dead in the tomb, and then he went out of the tomb. We, but we're never shown that. <clears throat> the only time we're ever seeing Jesus or, or risen from the dead, he is outside of the tomb. And, and, and the only thing the angel says about Jesus in regards to the tomb is, he's not here. You can look where he was, but he's not here anymore. You can see where they laid him, but, but he's not here anymore. Now, why did he do that? To show them that he's not there. And, but, but that wasn't all to the message, because then the angel said, go ahead and look, 
And but when you you need, but then you need to get going. You have something to do. Take a look, but you need to go tell his disciples now. And, and so he's going to go ahead of you to Galilee, just like he said he would. You're going to see him there. So take a look where he was and then be on your way. And so they did. They took a look and then they left the tomb. <clears throat> now back to that big question. What was Jesus doing after he rose from the dead? Or specifically to this encounter, what, why did, what was the purpose in all this? And the, the purpose, first and foremost, was to, he just wanted to let them know. They needed to know that he's alive, that he's risen. And not just alive, but risen. And not just risen, but busy. He had things to do. That even though he finished the work of what was required to save sinners, he still had things to do. He, got, he had things to do that he still wanted his disciples involved with. And, and none of that was going to take place in the tomb. None of it was good. The tomb is simply to take a look at so that you can confirm and be satisfied and realize he's not there. But it's not somewhere to hang out. The whole scene at the tomb was to communicate that so that they would have the hope that they needed to motivate them to do the continued work that he had for them to do. He, the, that whole scene was at the tomb was for nothing else than to bless them and encourage them and motivate them. And because he is alive, the tomb, the empty tomb is an amazing thing. But it's not to be the focus. It's a truly amazing thing. Anyone who's ever been to Israel, I didn't get to go recently. But anyone's ever been there, I'm sure it's, it's got to be amazing. But Jesus never let himself be seen there. The tomb was a temporary thing. You're not going to find him there. The tomb is not to be a monument, but a motivation. And as Christians, it, what it motivates us and reminds us and tells us regularly and all the time and as much as we need to know it is that we're not following, we're not just following the, the, the teachings of some ancient, you know, some ancient sage of long ago. Some person who lived a really cool life and taught a lot of good things and unfortunately is no longer with us, but we want to perpetuate those ideas because they were so good. That's not what it is. He's alive. He's risen. And that scene at the tomb was to make it clear. And so the command to go ahead and take a look, but then get going and go tell people, that's still the deal. And, and of, of all of this was to motivate them, and it did. You've seen what you need to see. Now go talk about it. That's what, that's what they were told. Don't look for Jesus among the dead. Don't look for Jesus in history only. Don't look for him from long ago. Look for him today. Do what he's telling you to do today. He told them, he told her, and he had told them before, that he was going to go ahead of them. We're not trying to get Jesus to join us. He's trying to get us to join him. I'm going to go ahead. Come join me. And, and, and so the cross didn't stop that. The grave could not hold him. He, he used these things to motivate people, to show nothing can stop them. And that's important. He want, that's what he was doing when he rose, to make that clear. The second thing is that after he rose, Jesus wanted to show that he still works in personal relationship. He still works personally in people's lives. I think one of the most awesome things about this whole passage is how it, we're told that uh, it specifically tells us that Mary was the first person that got to see him. That he showed himself first to Mary Magdalene. And how it reminds us, you know, the one that had seven demons in her, that Mary. And, and the Holy Spirit made a point of telling us that that was who saw him first. And I, I think that's cool too because of how the way that the disciples would argue you know, who gets to be the best? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that wasn't in the Bible. That they, no, no, I saw him first. But why was she the first person? Did Jesus plan it that way? Did he go, Mary's really my favorite. She's always been my favorite. And since, you know, I'm risen now and I'm just going to show everybody. No, I don't think that's what it, what, is, what it was at all. I don't know for certain, but I, I think it's fair to say that she got to see him first because she went there first and lingered there the longest. The, Jeremiah 29, 13, God says, you, you're going to seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. G Jesus also taught 
that who is forgiven much loves much. And so many people love the Lord during his earthly ministry. But, but if you were, if, um, I imagine if there were some way to, to compare the depth of love for the Lord from one person to another. If you could somehow see that, which you can't, you can see expressions of it. But if you could somehow see, you know, if there was some sort of, I don't know, glow about us or something that made it look like that guy loves that, the Lord more than that person. That if you were able to see that, that we'd see in Mary a love for Jesus greater than many, many other people. She, he did so much for her. I, again, I have no I know what he's delivered me from. I'm so glad that he has. But seven demons. And, and, that, and that's why she got up so early. And that's why even when his body was gone, she just stayed there longer and, and wept and longed for him. I, I don't tend to think that Jesus plan, planned this ahead of time. I could be wrong. But, but I think that he saw her there. And because he loved her, of course, it was an opportunity. He, he just said, I just want to bless Mary. And so he gave her this personal blessing. This was a gift that she not only had to be first, but it was alone. We read more of the detail of it in John. And, and he did a lot of things when he was risen from the dead, but he did this personally. And it shows us that in that sense, Jesus is no different after he raises from the dead than he was before. Then, that he enjoyed blessing people with special time with them, alone time. He did this with the 12 often. He'd take the 12 just away from everybody else. And then he took the three, Peter, James, and John. Sometimes he'd take just them. And, and, and there's all kinds of different examples of when he would take uh, people aside by himself. You know, he said, Zacchaeus, I'm, you, I'm going to your house today. And, and to Nathaniel, he spent a little bit of time. The woman at the well. And the demoniac in, in, in Gadara. And others. Jesus is a personal savior. And, and, he was, and he was showing that he still would be after the cross and after the resurrection. And, and this scene with Mary is not the only time he does that in the Bible, by the way, after he's risen from the dead. He, he, we're told um, again in the next couple verses about the, the, those two on the way to Emmaus. We're told about how he met he spoke personally with Peter to restore him after he denied him. Where we know that Saul of Tarsus got saved, you know, personally, met with the Lord personally. Jesus is a personal Savior. He was a personal Savior before he died and rose again, and he's still a personal Savior today. He'll meet you if, if you seek him like Mary did, or even if, if you just are heartbroken and burdened and longing for him, which is also what Mary did here. He, he loves to reveal himself to people like that. And, and he shows us here. He made it clear. We don't, we don't have, look, we don't just keep Jesus alive in our hearts by our memories. I, that's something people say sometimes when somebody passes away. They're just trying to grab for something, you know, they're he, they're they're going to remain alive in our you know we don't do, that's not how it is he's real he's alive he's risen the third thing that Jesus was doing after his resurrection is he he wanted to make it abundantly clear that unbelief is still a sin and without faith it's impossible to please him I I can't help but think this part was particularly planned Jesus could have easily shown himself to the eleven earlier than he did. It would have been no problem for him to just, you know, for if you want to look at it another way, you know, here he is, and he's like, I don't want these guys to argue about who got to see me first. So I'm going to show myself to all 11 of them all at the same time so that they can. He could have done that, but he didn't. He showed himself to Mary first, then he showed himself to those two unnamed disciples, and both times the, they went and told him, we saw the Lord. And, 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 and each time it says they didn't believe it. And then after that happened, he showed himself to the eleven. And, and we're told what he did. We said it. He rebuked them. That means he, he let them, you know, he, he let them have it. They didn't believe, and he let them know that he was not happy about that. Now, why didn't they believe? If you only want to look at it from a purely logical perspective, we could, we, it makes sense to us. P 
people don't usually come back from the dead. And I say usually because these disciples know at least a couple cases where Jesus rose somebody from the dead. The little girl, uh, Lazarus too. We know in the Old Testament somebody wrote, people wrote, uh, uh, there was a, a, a resurrection. So not you, but this is usually not the case. People don't usually come back from the dead. And not only that, but they so they have those examples, but they also realize, man, the way that Jesus died, I mean, cru crucifixion. And and yeah, people rise from the dead, but you know, maybe they're thinking in terms of resuscitation or something, man. In resurrection, that's a really bad death. And so uh, you know, maybe it's part of that. And they also knew something about grief. In fact, that they were in the midst of grief themselves. And they, they could understand that grief can be such, it's so strong, that sometimes grief is expressed in a, in a strong denial. So strong that you can't accept what's true. And maybe they looked at Mary, and maybe they looked at the other two, and they're going, man, we understand what you're going through, and you just... You just want him to be alive. And we understand that. We want him to be alive too. But you got to face facts. He's not alive. He died. Your grief is just overcoming you. You know, maybe they're thinking that way. They so wanted him to be alive that they just imagined it. Maybe, that, maybe these are the reasons. Maybe these are the reasons why they so easily rejected what they were told. But that's not what Jesus said the reason was. Jesus had a much simpler, more basic reason he, he said it was unbelief and hardness of heart. In other words, Jesus said it was sin that they didn't believe that what they were told. And when he heard, when he appeared to them, that's what he, that's what he said. He rebuked them for it. He didn't go, now guys, I know, I, I know it's kind of hard to swallow, but now you see me. So he said, man, you guys, come on. Why didn't you believe it? And he rebuked them. And he rebuked them in light of, he, he rebuked them for not, not believing it once they saw him. That would have been bad too. That would have been, I don't know, maybe probably worse. But he rebuked them for not believing one of their own, one of their own telling them, we saw him. To Jesus, his believers should have believed the testimony of other believers. They should have believed the testimony of people they knew that were, really did believe in him. And, and when, when they said something that, that lined up with what he had already said, and that lined up with the word of God in, to Jesus, they ought to have believed that. Now, why was that so important to the Lord? It, it, well, for many reasons, but one main reason is because of what he's going to tell them next that he's going to give them the Great Commission next. That he's going to tell them, You're, you now need to go out and preach this message. You now need to go tell people the way that they told you without seeing it. You need to call people to believe that. And when people believe it, they'll be saved. And if they don't, they won't be saved. And, and so how could they possibly effectively preach that if they didn't believe it themselves? How could they call people to believe in something they haven't seen if they wouldn't believe it without seeing it? And, and not only that, but how can the church even be united if they wouldn't believe the testimony of fellow believers? And, and, and that testimony lined up with what they already knew Jesus said and what was confirmed in the Word of God. They, they, how, can, how can the church have any success and benefit and unity if we won't even believe each other as it relates to the word of God and what Jesus said. That was a big deal to Jesus then and it still is today. The Lord works through faith. Salvation is through faith. I don't know exactly how that works, but that's what the Bible says. It's true. It's biblical. And not only that, but he so works that way that even when he was here on earth, there were times that it says he couldn't do very many miracles because the people didn't believe. It says that. I don't know how that works. I don't know why that is. But that's how it is. And the, and the Lord wants to do great works in us and through us and among us. And, I, and, I, and we have to wonder how often... They simply don't happen merely because 
his people don't believe? Like how many times has he, I don't know the answer to this question, but how many times has he wanted to do something in and through us, but we didn't believe it? We didn't believe it. Maybe someone had an experience with the Lord. And it's a personal experience, of course, because that's how he works. He's personal, but it was real. And, and they tell us. And even though it's not outside of what we read in the Bible, it's within the realm of Scripture, but, but because it's rare, just like a resurrection is rare, because it doesn't happen very often and it hasn't happened very many times, and we've personally never seen it happen, we doubt it or we quickly reject it. And I wonder how often that happens. Our, where our very first reaction to someone telling us about some experience that they had with the Lord, where it's just the thing, I don't know, man. And maybe we're too polite to say that to their face. Maybe we're not. Some people don't know how to be polite. But maybe we're too polite to say it to their face. But in our mind, they're telling us, the Lord spoke to me, man. The Lord showed me this. The Lord did that. And, and, and we're like, in the back of our mind, we're like, yeah, yeah, right. And the fact of the matter is, that's in the Bible. Why do we not believe what's in the Bible? Because it's rare? And, and the Bible says, don't, don't despise prophecy. But somebody says, I have a prophecy from the Lord. I have a word from the Lord. And we're like, I don't know. If he lives, and we say he lives, that's what we're doing today. Doesn't he still speak? Doesn't he still speak and personally to people? I, I mean, we have to believe that. Why do we find it so hard to believe what the Bible says plainly? I think we should let this search us. I think we should be open to the possibility that not believing is, in, then when we just go quickly reject, somebody says something to me. That it, we, maybe our heart is hard, and maybe that's why well, we're not seeing as much as what we could be seeing. And maybe he's rebuking us for it. He rebuked them for it. It makes sense that if we're acting the same way, that he would rebuke us for it. And, and so after the resurrection, Jesus made sure to point out and rebuke unbelief. We ought to think about that. Now we get to the Great Commission where Jesus wanted to give the great command that his people are to preach the gospel. Again, I'm going to read it again. Verse 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. This might be one of the well, most well-known things Jesus did after he rose again, the Great Commission, the Great Command. And, and we get the full picture of it when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke together. And, and here in Mark, he simply says, preach the gospel to every creature. That, he, that means go preach this gospel to the whole world. And, and we know what the gospel is. It's uh, summarized uh, beautifully in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, he, he, and, and uh, he was buried and he rose again. And then Luke adds to this great commission that, that we're to preach repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins in his name, in the name of Jesus. He died, he rose again, you need to uh, repent of your sins and believe in him for the forgiveness of your sins. And then Matthew adds to the great commission make disciples. And so you put the whole thing together and the church was, is, is called and commanded to tell people that they can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again and that, and that if they believe in that, that they'll be saved and that when they believe in that, that we're to teach them how to be followers of Jesus for the rest of their lives. That's what... Uh, uh, making disciples means. And, and so Jesus made this command clear when he rose from the dead. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to tell people, Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He rose again. We're supposed to tell people, you need to trust in him so that your sins will be forgiven. And when you die, you'll go to heaven. 
And then when people believe that, we're supposed to tell people, now here's how you follow him. And we teach the Bible to, to make disciples. We encourage each other to, meet, to make disciples. We meet together in his name to make disciples. We're not told that we're supposed to go save people. That's his work. We can't save anybody. We're not told that we're supposed to gather a huge crowd of people and make a big old church. He builds the church. We're not told that we have to force Christians to act a certain way and follow the, the rules the way that we follow him. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. But we're supposed to preach how to be saved. We're supposed to teach how to follow him. And we need to do that. We need to call people to attention that this is, this is what God has done. This is what the Son of God did. And to call them, invite them, trust Him, follow Him, walk with Him, obey the Lord. And He commands us to do that. It's a command. That's what He was doing when He rose from the dead. He gave that great command. And the reason why that's... He could have said this before He died. But look, when something amazing happens, when something life-changing happens, you know, if we could go through right now and we could all ask, what were you doing during 9-11 if you were born yet? And you know what was going on because it was such a monumental event. You know. Well, this is a monumental event. And this is why he said it now. What, what, What did he say when you saw him raised from the dead? He told us we need to go preach the gospel and make this. He told us to do that. And because he lives, we can do it. And then the second part of what he says here that tells us that Jesus wants us to expect signs to happen when people believe. Uh, 17 and 18, again, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will, make, they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So this part challenges me. Jesus was telling his disciples, here's the command, here's what you do, and here's what you can expect when people believe. Here's what you can expect. These signs will follow, or they will accompany people believing. Now some will, he said, some will believe, and they'll be saved. Others won't believe, and they won't be saved. And, and I, 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 I personally think that what he says here in verse 17 and 18 about these signs, it's not meant to be an exhaustive list of, of the things that will happen. And I also don't think that it's meant that every single person who believes is going to experience every single one of these things. But he did say they would follow. And he said, that we should, and he said that because he wanted them to know what to expect, know what to look for. That we'll be able to see these things when, when we see these things, we'll be able to know this is real faith. And, and there would be power over demonic spirits, just like he did. That there would be new tongues. Now, no, that doesn't mean that they would learn that they would speak in language real languages that they never knew. That's a different Greek word. There's a different Greek word for languages. He's saying new tongues. You're going to speak in new ways. And, and there would be strength over threats and dangers. He's talking you know, about the serpents and the drinking deadly things. And, um, and that there would be healings. That there would be healings through the hands of believers. And Jesus said that these things would follow faith. And he, and he said that so that they would expect them to look for them. If we want to boil this down to a, a, a principle, I think we could say, when Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, rose from the dead on the third day, he told his followers, go preach, and when people believe, watch for spiritual signs from it. You're going to see them. You're going to see supernatural evidence in the life of people who believe. And, and one of the big things we know from other parts of the Bible is they're going to live their life differently. Number, You should totally see that. You shouldn't keep sinning the way that you were. But there should also be spiritual 
um, supernatural spiritual gifts happening in people's lives. We should expect that. Now here's a question, simple question. Do we see that? And, and maybe even a better question is, do you expect to see that? Do we expect? And if the answer is, no, I don't usually, I don't really expect that, then we need to think long and hard about what he said here and ask, why don't we expect that? Read it again and ask. Jesus made it a point to say this when he rose from the dead and he included it with the Great Commission. We don't take, why would we take the part of the Great Commission about what we're supposed to do? And I think most Christians take that very seriously. We take it very seriously. We're supposed to go do this. Why would we take the part what we should expect to happen less? And that's why I said it convicts me, because I, I'll be honest, sometimes, often I think much less of that. Oh yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to go preach. But I don't know how much I expect this. And I, I think if, if that's the case with you or me or any of us, that's something we need to repent of. And, and we should consider that attitude and that lack of expectation as, as something that reveals a desperate need to be repented of, as something that we should make a point of prayer, that, Lord, pour out your Spirit upon us and we pray that you'll do these things again. I think that's a, a simple way of saying we need some revival. And, and he said, preach it and then watch and then expect. And, and if Jesus did these things before he died, if he rose from the dead, why would we expect him to not do them anymore? He said that I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and you're going to do greater works. If, if we don't see these things, we need to start praying hard that we would. That people would get, that we would first be motivated to go fulfill the command of the Great Commission. And then that he would show us what he said we would see when we do it. And then the last thing here that Jesus did, at least from Mark's perspective, is, and, is that he wanted us to know where he went and where he's going. And that also was for uh, more encouragement for us to be able to keep busy. It says he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And, and, they went, and, then, they went, and then it also says that they went out and preached. And, and the Lord did what he said. He, he, he gave them the signs that he said he would give. He wanted them to know. You're not going to see me much anymore. Very little. He, he's been seen. But, but I want you to know where I am. I want you to know. So that you don't start second guessing yourself and maybe he was just a ghost. Maybe, we, maybe it was all grief. You know, we, we grieved so hard. We so wanted to be alive. We imagined that we saw him. We were just overcome that way. They saw him ascend into heaven and they, they know that he's seated at the right hand of God. And the Bible says, what's he doing there? The Bible says he always lives to make intercession for us. He's talking to the Father about you and me. He's interceding. And the Bible also says what he's doing there is he's making a place for us. And, and then he's going to come again and take us to be there with him. But that's where he is right now. That's where his physical risen body is right now. His spirit, on the other hand, lives in his church. If you're a believer, the Spirit lives in you. But that's where he is. And he wants us to know that so that we can be confident. He's talking to the Father, interceding for us. He's preparing a place for us. And he said if he prepares a place for us, he'll come again. And, and, and so the one that conquered death and defeated death and, and rose from the grave He's in, he's, he's at the throne of God. That's where he is. And so we can say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The Lord is alive. He's on his throne. He's preparing a place for us. He's working in his church by his spirit. He's coming again. He's coming again. 
And we're to, we're to be busy about his business, calling people to believe in him, proclaiming his death and resurrection until he comes. And, and, and one thing, and I haven't said this in a while, it's our fourth week uh, having church this way, is that if this time that we're going through, one of the great things that ought to be pointing us to is that that time of his return is close. It's close. There's so much in the Bible that tells us what to look for to know we're getting close. And this is huge. This is a huge thing. We're close. It's not the only thing. There's all kinds of stuff. You read through the prophecies, it's close. But what does that mean? That means our the, the time for us to fulfill the Great Commission, we, we only have a little bit of time left. And so may the Lord not only remind us that he's risen, but stir us up with resurrection power to go preach the gospel, to reach out to people with the love of Jesus. And we pray that he would do that. We pray that if you haven't believed yet again as we start the service, believe him. Believe him. Believe him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're alive. We say that we believe in you, Lord, so help us to obey you. Help us to know, Lord, that, that you want us to know you're alive, that you still work personally in our lives, that you hate unbelief. You want us to believe you, that you want us to obey your command to, to preach the gospel and look for evidence of belief. And we pray for those, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name that we would see those signs that you said we, we should see. And Lord, we pray we would about, be about your business. And Lord, if we're not, that we would repent. We love you, Lord. We pray you'd bless the rest of our week. We pray that you bless the rest of our Resurrection Sunday. Bless every home and every family. Bless those that just happened to see because they were watching online or listening on the air. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.